My name is Greg Corbin and I'm coming to you today with the alternative spring break created by none other than words, beats, and life. And today I am sitting here with Josh Duncan Ashe, who is the founder and the executive director of Love Now Media. Thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Thank you so much for having me today, Greg. Yes, yes. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So I grew up in North Philadelphia, um, which I think at the time I was growing up, it was considered one of the most underserved areas in mm -hmm. Philly. Yeah. And that really exposed me to a lot. Um, I had access to things outside of my community, but living in my community, I got to see how inequities existed and how some things um, went for us where we lived and went a little differently for people outside of my community. And so I think I had a lens that helped me to understand very early on that, ha, huh, you know, I, I can be a change agent, you know, in my community. Yo, that's, that's powerful, right? <laughs> like like this, to be the character in the storyline of life mm -hmm. in which people see it on you. They say, hey, you, you, I can see you saving the world, right? And, and, and or trying to, right? And how that plays a role. And you're also a poet, a storyteller, and a dancer. Mm -hmm. How did that all come about? When I was young, again, I was kind of like nurtured for my family mm -hmm. to be a leader. But in my community, like we say now, oh, that was cool. They saw it on you. You wanted to change things, but it was annoying. I was like an annoying kid. We should do this better. And people just wanted to chill, right? So, um, so, um, so there was a, a bit of a conflict there. But when I was 14, um, I lost my father and my mother really like succumbed to addiction. So I found myself in a situation where all of the things I was trying to do, um, I had to figure out how to get the support I needed to, to do them and so uh, to do those things. And so um, interestingly, through the arts, um, I just really stuck with dance. I didn't really want to go to school for dance. I actually went to school for business and technology um, when I went to college. But I always did my African dance. There was something about it that um, just like gave me the family that I felt I was missing. Um, there were these practices and rituals and stories that helped to make sense of life. And so we would go and there would be rhythms that um, had, had meanings that were from different African regions. And so learning about the ways that I was connected to the world helped me to deal with this sense of like um, having like a, a as existential understanding, you know, of who I was that was beyond just the personal suffering I was experiencing and the community suffering that I witnessed. Mm -hmm. So I became a professional African dancer. Um, what I learned is that I had been introduced probably when I was younger and so there was something that called me to that space. But the thing that really kept me in that space was the way that community was built um, in the African dance community, the way that stories were transferred and the ways that um, the elders kind of cared for the youth. I was a youth who really needed that. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I started to tell stories about what I was experiencing in that kind of African dance community and just became a storyteller. And it's, it's phenomenal, right? To hear how these things play out mm -hmm. and connect. As you, you, you went in deeper into storytelling, I know you've had many different ventures, stories, have a huge way of impacting somebody's imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where did the inspiration come about to create Love Now Media? Well, I've always understood the power of stories. I remember being a little kid in North Philly feeling like I had no connection to what I was seeing on the news. I had no connection to really what I, what I was seeing in, in movies. But, you know, when I heard rap music, and especially people like, you know, Rakim and Special Ed. It, it was like this, this energy of confidence and this energy of um, documenting and articulating just this, this cultural um, power that I experienced from day to day. Yeah. And um, I didn't really see that anywhere else. So I loved hip hop. Like I was like a young girl who had like a big boom box <laughs> and all of that. And so I always understood the power of stories and, um, and of documenting 
uh, what was actually happening in community. Uh, learned the art of cinematography and, and, and documentary film and was a resource for mostly Philadelphia communities in documenting um, stories about African dance, about culture, about history. But as kind of like the Black Lives Matter movement and especially like Occupy Wall Street um, started to happen, Occupy Philadelphia, I started to document a lot of protest. And as I was making those media pieces, I realized there's like an energy here and I felt like there was more. And I personally became triggered by constantly documenting stories of pain. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the news was actually really interested in, in those stories as well. So yes, I was trying to find this new angle to tell stories from this very truthful perspective, which um, represented black and brown people in a nuanced way, but I'm like fighting to do this with news media that is kind of like exploiting stories of black pain. And I found for the first time that I was kind of burned out and, and like really sad. Um, so in thinking about like, well, what do I do about this? How do I stay active in the movement? Um, I decided to look for something different. And so going to the protests, instead of just like capturing the fists that were angry in the air, right. I looked for the other hands that were holding each other up. And I literally shifted my lens to capture something different. And I started to change. I started to feel different. You know, so I remember that first um, protest rally that I captured. When I, when I made the work, I'm like, wow, I feel good about what I'm contributing to the moment, right? So when we think about love now, it's like, yes, I'm, ca I'm capturing love, but there's a moment that is happening. There's a now, there is activism. There, there are people who are changing policies. There are people, you know, advocating for justice. That is the now. And so a lot of people think about, you know, the love and love now media, but the now is also very important. We, 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 we had plenty of conversations talking about how the news programs people to see their, see their world in a way that is often negative, in a way that's fear-based. Mm -hmm. And specifically, when we think about gun violence in Philadelphia, we're looking at it being associated with black men mm -hmm. and boys mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. We don't think about any group more than we think about black boys and black men when it comes to violence in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. especially around guns. Could you share and elaborate why that project? Well, it's actually really personal to to me again growing up in north philadelphia i had a number of friends colleagues family members die from gun violence or, or violence in general um i also knew those people and, and knew some of the other struggles they were having as it related to having family support mm -hmm. um you know having access to like safe and comfortable housing uh, as it related to, you know, having educators who actually understood what they were dealing with at home, who yeah. were not looking to, um, you know, penalize them for maybe not coming to school with the proper supplies, you know. So um, it's a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. There, There's a lot connected. And I think it's very easy to um, look at the outcomes and say, wow, there's so many um, there's so many black boys and, and men kind of dying from, from gun violence, yeah. but you know, what happens if we kind of change our perspective and say maybe these are the most misunderstood people in our communities, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. so maybe we need to take more space to actually listen to the people who are most harmed by this issue so that we can understand their actual needs and then design systems and policies to actually meet them, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, that, that is my intention. We have to think about like big systemic um, process dri driven change in order to address this issue. Yeah. It's not just about the guns. It's not just about the men. It's about how this whole thing was designed. And um, in order to redesign it and dismantle the systems that are causing this harm, we really have to take more space to um, to listen mm -hmm. and to not only listen, but to document 
and to implement change yeah. following, you know, what we hear. To shift the conversation a little bit, you know, what is one of your favorite projects? 11 Days of Love Stories. <laughs> it's, it has been my favorite project. Basically, the idea is that through the arts, through um, educational programs, through partnering with uh, small businesses, that we would take these love storytelling workshops to different communities. What I was able to see is that in going to uh, Colored Girls Museum, to uh, Atia Ola's, you know, Spirit Foods First Cafe, to a recreation center, you know, going to all of these different places and having people from all walks of life, you know, sit in community together, black folks, white folks, Asian folks, to talk about love. It was really breaking down barriers that um, I think just the average kind of town hall meetings, it, it wasn't having this, the same effect. I think starting the conversation with love and framing these questions in the context of love helped us to um, make people feel safe mm -hmm. in sharing their beliefs, their values, and then that helped us to better empathize with people. So. For example, um, a, a common way that, um, that I would hear um, people from underserved communities describe how they learned the definition of love is like, when we all had to share food or when I didn't have what I needed and somebody showed up for me, whereas someone from a more privileged situation might say, oh, I learned the definition of love by like, by like having a routine or by someone sending me on a trip to Paris, you know, or something like that. It's just totally different experiences, but bringing people into a room with this common theme of love mm -hmm. made it safe for people to share that. And then people could see, oh, this is not necessarily a bad person. They're just coming from a privileged situation. Yeah or this person is actually coming from a situation where they didn't have what I had in order to arrive at the same ways of thinking about this moment today. Yes, so yes. That is beautiful because what I keep hearing is the theme of communication. Mm -hmm. And I think you need communication to commune, to build the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that, that love, that's, that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, you know, just questions around becoming more executive minded, mm -hmm. more business minded. I know you also worked at a radio station mm -hmm. and you were a program, are you a program director? I started as the program director and then moved to the director of product management. That's powerful, mm -hmm. right? Like, cause you're an artist <laughs> and we don't get to see artists become executives for, mm -hmm. for I mean, for media companies mm -hmm. and then build their own. That's mm -hmm. like, you should be extremely proud mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. something that you've built and something that is you know, performing positive media mm -hmm. outcomes mm -hmm. for sure. How did, you know, how, did, how does the intersection of your, your childhood experiences, the relationship with your mom, the art, all mm -hmm. these things come together and your experience with the radio station inform how you approach Love Now Media, mm -hmm. both professionally and personally as you evolve? So I'm very proud of what I've been able to do on the executive level. I will say that there were people who took a chance on me. Um, there was a, a woman um, who worked for WHYY, Sandra Clark. Um, she was the vice president of civic engagement and news there. And in 2018, she saw what I was doing in communities with Love Now Media, and she said, we need this in news, right? That, that was huge for Love Now Media. She hired me at WHYY to do workshops community workshops, and those workshops um, then produced stories that were published on WHYY. From there, um, Sarah M. Lomax hired me as a program director, which is essentially an executive role. She took a chance on me. I didn't have any radio experience. I had lots of video production experience, but she trusted that my on the ground uh, relationships my character, um, the, the, the way that I produced content would add value to Word Radio. I, I would have to thank, you know, Louis Messiah, Sandra Clark, and Sarah M. Lomax, you know, for supporting uh, my journey and for giving me access. With that, you know, I was able to apply all of that to Love Now Media. And so when I um, exited, you know, my role at the radio station, still stayed great friends with them, even did some work as a consultant. 
um, I was able to just start applying um, some of the things I was able to test as an employee uh, to my work um, in leadership. And so I was always the founder and executive, uh, you know, the director or executive producer, you know, of Love Now Media, but I hadn't always been operating as an executive. I was kind of like an artist out here trying to figure it out. But once I was able to get kind of that mentorship to be in an environment where I actually had to manage people, manage their expectations, build systems, produce outcomes, really figure out how to talk and write about that to um, to really, you know, raise money, then I was on fire. And so that's where I am now. And I'm also in a position where I'm able to teach others how to do that. So I'm partnering with um, the Limfest Institute, for example to help give out um, $15,000 core grant funds to media entrepreneurs. And so to be in a position to lead that, that program design, to lead the program, to do that, it's like, it's really great. It's, it's really um, an evolution. You know, I really appreciate looking back on my journey, knowing that I was just out there doing African dance, trying to save the world. And now I'm really in a position where I get to, to make a, like a, a really critical impact um, that helps to create a more equitable media ecosystem. What's powerful is listening to you talk about the pillars of mentorship mm -hmm. and the people holding you up and how you haven't forgotten them. And I think that is amazing. And it's something I, I don't think a lot of people get to verbalize a lot mm -hmm. of how people help guide them along the path and what mentorship look like because it sounds like that was more so what you were talking about as well as getting paid and 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 really big ups to each one of those people Louis, sandra and sarah mm -hmm. i can't say their whole names that's okay. that's okay but 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 I, I i find it interesting because for for the people who watch this interview it's important that we acknowledge that we're standing on people's shoulders mm -hmm. whether we notice it or not and it looks different mm -hmm. in every way um so I have two more questions for you, but I want to make sure I get this question right. The question is, what do I know now that I didn't know when I started this journey? So <laughs> what do you know now that you didn't know when you started this journey with Love Now Media? Um, I didn't know that capitalism is as powerful as it is and has influenced um, people's ability to like succeed, to um, have resources, to, um, to navigate space. I didn't realize um, that this system is, is like, it's like a hard system. I, I think I thought that I could approach everything with softness and, um, and you know, love and graciousness and <laughs> all of that, and that things would just heal and the flowers would grow from the ground. Over the years, I have learned that money is a part of what helps us to have those seeds that get planted. Mm -hmm. I don't think I value, like I, I think I, I wanted to not value money as a necessary resource. Mm -hmm. And now I see it as an essential, you know? So um, there's this thing that like, if you do what you love, you never have to work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. I, I believed that and it was a big part of like, what led me to, go forward with my work. It's not necessarily true. <laughs> wow. It's work. So I want to do work that is not only enjoyable or not only that I love, but I want to do work that that produces outcomes. Um, and uh, some of those outcomes um, require resources. Um, the other thing is like, everybody's not going to like you. No matter how how well you treat people, no matter how much you make yourself available to support people. Um, there are some people just based on how they learn to, to love, based on what they value, based on what their intentions are, they just are not gonna like you. So you have to just kind of be willing to accept that people will perceive you in, in a way that, that makes them feel safe you know, and, and based, uh, based on their own healing, you know. And so, um, so for me, I've learned to just accept that. So that's a, another thing. And I would say the third thing is I had to learn how important I was to the, the outcome of my work. I was thinking about my work is like, oh, I can do this work. I can do these things. It's like, I need to eat. I need to be well rested. I need to feel safe when I'm sleeping at night. I need to be able to pay my bills. I need, like, I'm a human being. 
you know? And so um, I have to put me first, which is not always about my comfort. It's about me like waking up in the morning saying, I need to meditate. I need to put my own care before I put the care of the community. I have to care for myself. I have to assess how I'm feeling today. I have to, um, all of the stuff that I talk about, you know, for making the world better, before I feel anyone else in terms of like the empathy centered work, I have to feel me. And so that's something that I've learned. Ooh, you speak in self care <laughs> and you, you can't give mm -hmm. what you do not give yourself to others. Mm. It's just not gonna happen. So you have to generate the energy you desire internally and then go out into the world and be that. Can you leave one wise word for the, the, uh, a young person that's aspiring to start a company, mm -hmm. to be a media, personality or a professional to be a storyteller, a dancer, like what's one word you have for somebody that's up and coming, a young person, like what can you tell them? Focus, focus. I think it can be really easy to have a, a bright idea and then another idea and then 15 more ideas in between and you try to execute on each one. Focus, finish something, then assess whether it worked or not, and then start something new. That would be my advice because I see too many people trying to do too many things, and I might may have been guilty of this <laughs> at some point <laughs> in my life. You know, as a dancer, I can sing a song when I get ready. You know, I'm an IT person. I'm a technologist. You know, I'm doing media. One day I'm in journalism. It's, it's a lot going on. But if you are working on like one thing at a time. And if you're focused on that, usually, you know, it doesn't take too long for you to build some traction, to get supporters, to get, um, you know, investors or, or grant funds. And, mm -hmm. and t then you can build. But if you if you just are, are all over the place, it's very hard for people to figure out how to support you because they're falling in between your lines. You got to just focus, focus, build an idea and build it up and keep measuring the impact. And so that, that would be my advice. You're doing amazing work. Oh, thank you, Greg. Keep going. <laughs> okay, keep I going. will. I'm focused. When I say love, you say now. Love. Now. Love. Now. Love. Now. Love. Oh, love. I, got a, I got a better one. What do you want? <laughs> love. When do you want it? Now. How do you get it? Love. love. Now. How do you get it? Love. love now. now. Oh, okay. That's dope. That's dope. <laughs> no, thanks so much for joining us, y'all. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right. I'll turn to spring break. Philly session, Josh Duncan, Ashe, executive director and the founder of Love Now Media.